In my opinion, I think the ACS meeting, national meeting, is not useful in this regard. I think it's really hard to meet people or have like a meaningful conversation. But smaller ones, more specialty ones, you know, Gordon conferences or, or similar ones like that, even international ones, um, were much more helpful because I could actually have substantial conversations with a lot of people. But that means that they're all, you know, much closer scientifically, which which is maybe not what you want. I think you want sort of a broad network um, because you need to get broad appeal from a lot of different faculty to get that interview. Uh, networking is incredibly important in this job, right? You know, the, the phrase, you know, is kind of overused, but it's not what you know, it's who you know. And to a certain extent, uh, that is true. <laughs> so I think going to conferences, like Gordon conferences, is incredibly important because you build relationships at those or much smaller conferences. And I'm sure in other fields, there's um, smaller conferences, you know, big ACS meaning. I don't, I would say that probably no one that came to my ACS talks, like, was from the University of Minnesota where I got a job. Um, but certainly I met people at Gordon conferences. So I think that's really important. But I do think, you know, as I had mentioned before, like anytime a seminar speaker comes in and they send an email out like, hey, do you want to have lunch with this person? Do it. Just anytime you have the opportunity to meet with an outside person, just absolutely do it. Networks, uh, that's how you build them. You don't have to have this fake networking of, you know, uh, like sometimes we all cringe at the word networking, but you can build relationships with people in science and, you know, as well as graduate students and postdocs and things like that. It doesn't just have to be professors. So for networking, I, um, you know, the first thing I did is I really thought through myself, like, is this the career I want to go through? Um, I actually did attend some other ACS kind of sessions on PUI careers um, at some points. So I think there's one every ACS meeting, I think there are some career sessions um, where there's presentations by people at um, PUIs. And so once I had that in my mind, then I talked to my advisor about it, and you know, he's a very supportive advisor. Um, so he said, you know, sure, you know, if you want to do this, you know, make sure you go all in on this. Here are all the previous people in the group who have gone on to careers at these types of institutions. Um, and so that was really nice because there was actually a great range. So there were people at community colleges, people at kind of more teaching focused PUIs and people at more research focused PUIs. And so I spoke to all the group alum, uh, alumni uh, who had gone on to these careers and I just tried to soak in as much information as possible there. Um, I reached out to kind of former TAs that I had when I was an undergrad that I knew had gone on to more PUI uh, jobs um, just to talk to them about what it was like um, just to kind of hear their perspective um, on what might be looked for in an application um, and all that. Um, and so through that, I think the networking was very helpful. I definitely, there were a lot of considerations I hadn't thought about. Um, you know, it seems obvious to say like, oh, if you're going to a place where they have you teaching five classes, you should know all of your teaching strategies ahead of time. No, I didn't really think about that. That's not something, you know, I was, you know, as a grad student, you're so like, this is research, I'm gonna get this research done. It's easy to forget um, the other side of the coin, I guess. So the networking, I learned a lot through that. the best training that I had in grad school was just uh, so I joined a new lab and that was incredibly important I knew how to start a lab I knew how to write grants for the first time I knew how to uh, recruit people to a certain extent you don't have to have that training but that was incredibly helpful for me that's one of the reasons why I chose to work in a new lab is I thought well if I want to do this someday like let's figure out if I actually want to do it and I actually can do it um, but when I was a graduate student, I took every opportunity that I possibly could to meet with people. So, you know, I asked my uh, grad advisor and he was gracious enough to give me like the last 10 minutes of a lot of his office meetings with faculty that would come in for the seminar speakers. We all meet with them for 30 minutes or an hour or something. And I would ask like, or he would ask me like, oh, I think this person is at a university I could see you working at. Like, why don't you meet with them? Uh, and so that was a really good opportunity. Anytime they sent out an email, are students interested in lunch? I, I was there no matter like kind of what field I was asking questions of the speakers um, I was you know really getting all the information I possibly could about this job and I was making connections so when I was at conferences I was you know acted very professionally and I you know met people and, and talked to them about their universities and their research and things like that 
Um, and I would also say, like, just in grad school, just reading the literature was incredibly important. And I know your PI will tell you, oh, you should be reading every day. You really should. <laughs> if you want a job like this, it's, you know, your proposals have to be exceptionally uh, creative and they can't be directly related to what you're doing now. And so in order to find ideas and things like that, it's really important to uh, read the literature a lot. Um, so I was lucky that my advisor, uh, Fraser, was very... He let people do all the writing of papers for grants and everything. Students, no matter how new they were, were also exposed to the writing. And I think that that was a huge piece of what helped me a lot in the process. Because as part of the job application, you have to write a proposal. And for some, I know I've heard of people where they don't get the chance to work on grants. And so they don't really have exposure to that whole process. And I felt like being able to do that was really useful. Uh, my advisor also was very big on attending conferences. So I would all students in this group would go to multiple a year. Um, so that really helped with my presentations, um, you know, just making nice slides and at least being able to express myself um, and express, talk about the science. Um, and I think a lot of uh, what he did in the group was that it was run kind of a bottom-up style. So students definitely were forced or asked to um, really take charge of their research projects. So um, I felt like from the very beginning of grad school, it was like just training me to be independent. And, and I think that was, you know, really, really useful. As soon as you start this faculty job, you know, it's... You have no one to ask for. Well, you have plenty of people to ask for help, but you're really on your own in many ways. Right? Um, it's your own independent research program and all that. So anything, any training on that front was um, super useful to me. And um, the other thing for the teaching side is that I did seek out some teaching opportunities. I TA'd um, some graduate classes, uh, I think two or three times now. Um, and then I also ended up teaching a summer general chemistry class. So, so this was through Northwestern. They have a bridge program uh, for incoming students. and. And they, you have kind of grad students and postdocs help to teach those. And so that was a great opportunity for me. Um, and so I would encourage students looking into teaching related jobs to think about trying that out. Um, it was really nice. It was a one month kind of really concentrated dose of teaching. Um, so I spent a lot of time on prepping that class. But at the same time, it wasn't like a whole semester taken up by having the teacher class. Um, I did two things while I was in grad school because I knew teaching was on the list of possibilities of careers for me. So I took the Preparing Future Faculty course. I took the main course, I can't remember the course number. Um, and then I took one of the seminars. Um, and those, especially the seminar that I took, really is where I drafted a CV and a resume for academic purposes, made that teaching statement, um, and they really, honestly helped me with a complete application package. What we don't get is management training. Um, I think running a research group is a lot like running a small business. Like you need to manage a budget, um, you need to fundraise. I think we do get some training for that um, in terms of grant writing. But you know, how do you deal with money? How do you manage it? And then how do you hire people? Um, we have very little training on making a decision about hiring somebody, and that is super important. I think when you start, that's the most important decision you make in your lab. Um, and then how do you motivate different people? Um, like, how do you actually be a manager and, and get people to work to their highest potential? We have sort of indirect training, you know, in academia for that, but um, you know, a lot of people actually, you know, write books on management or, you know, their management classes. And at least I never even thought of um, taking any of these or reading any of these. And I think that would have been a really useful um, aspect of training. You know, how do you actually manage and run a, a group from the business side to the sort of HR side? This job is, uh, it's a management position, right? So you're managing scientists, so you are using what you learned as a scientist, but you are managing people. Like, you are working with human beings with, you know, career aspirations that are different than yours, that uh, have emotions and different, you know, diverse backgrounds and things like that. And so I think it's really important in graduate school and as a postdoc to have the opportunities to mentor students. I think that's it served me well. You know, I've worked with students, uh, like in my postdoc, I worked with these two students uh, actually on the same project, and these two students could not have been more different at all. One was the most confident student you'll ever meet. One was like the least confident student you'll ever meet. 
Um, and you know, it's just that, that uh, very different personalities that you have to manage. And so I think it's really important to uh, ask your advisors like for the opportunity to manage. Undergraduate students, RU students, younger graduate students, even new postdocs that come in still need like help figuring out how things are going in the lab. And so, you know, getting yourself opportunities for management, I think, um, is a really incredibly important part of it. Yeah, so I think the parts that you don't get to see as much from the student or postdoc side is the you know, lab management type of stuff. So that's like finances, um, you know, we could, I you know, helped to write the grant, but I never really got to see how to spend the money on the grant. Um, one of the surprises coming in was kind of, you know, how much do people cost, right? So if I want to hire somebody, uh, there's their salary or their stipend, and then there's the benefits, and then there's the consumables and all these things. So kind of the management of lab resources, either in the money or in the instruments and the time, um, I felt like that was where I had the most to learn. Um, and then I think apart from that, the other thing where it's easy to go back and say I could have known all these things in the past um, is really just kind of project management. Um, as much as I said that there was independence um, in grad school for me and learning how to run a project, it's still very different when I got here and I was trying to run my own program, like uh, thinking about how to structure the entire program was a very different experience. Like as a grad student, I felt like I was very good at taking a project that could turn into a paper. Um, here it took me a little bit more time to think about how to take a project and let that grow into multiple projects, which then multiple papers and hopefully multiple grants. Um, and so a lot of that is just, you just got to think a lot, I think. Um, think about your ideas and really, it's easy to say this, but really just think about how that can grow to a bigger picture, right? Um, whereas compared to the grad school of thinking where it's more kind of short term, like I can get this published and have this project done. You know, uh, for me, the five year time scale of how can I get multiple things done here. Yeah. One thing is that um, I actually think it's okay to be more optimistic about a job search. You know, when I was applying, everything I heard was like, oh, these schools are getting, you know, 500 people applied to this one position or 400 people applied to this analytical chemistry position or whatever. And the odds just seemed incredibly daunting, you know, to be the one in 400 to get the offer just seems really unlikely statistically. One thing that I think I've maybe come to appreciate more is um, a lot of those applications just kind of don't meet the bar. And I think people generally know what the bar is. You know, to get an interview, you have to have a good track record. That means publications, but it also means, you know, can people point to you were the person who did this in this in your group or you know what what was the scientific advancement you made and if your letter writers can speak to that you know that's sort of the bar that we look for for past work and then the research ideas have to be good um, you know people have to read them and think wow if that worked that would be really cool or that would you know that would be useful we would really advance science in this way um, if this person could get that to work and um, you know, not all of the applications meet that bar. And so if you're applying and you do meet that bar and you have, you know, mentors telling you that you meet that bar, I actually think the odds are much higher. Um, and so I talk to people who are scared off of applying because of these numbers, and that's very reasonable. The statistics do not look good. Um, but I really do think that uh, it's much more feasible um, especially if it's a reasonable fit. You know, of those 400 applications, not all of them are chemists. And we're a department of chemistry. We want you to have, like, taken some chemistry classes or published in chemistry-related journals. That's not, like, a crazy requirement. Um, and so I actually think, you know, the odds are, are better. Um, and I also think that getting the interview is, is definitely tough. You know, the odds are better. They're not guaranteed, for sure. There's probably 50 reasonably good applications um, for one or two spots. But I do think once you get the interview, that's where you can also prepare and stand out. And the bar there um, is actually, I think, pretty low in terms of preparing and convincing people that you really want to come to whatever school you're visiting. Um, and you know that you'd be a good fit or that you'd contribute. I think that 
you know, once you get that interview, you really can put effort in, and that effort makes a difference. Um, so I think the main thing, the main way my thinking has changed is that um, it's not as awful as the initial statistics look. Um, and I think that's been my experience as well. Um, but that means, you know, talking to mentors and stuff and making sure that your perception of how you're doing is aligned with theirs and, you know, that you'll have strong letters that say that. I would say, uh, you know, being both like going through the interview process recently and now being on the other side for the first time, I would say don't take anything personally. <laughs> uh, you have no idea what a university is looking for in a colleague. You have no idea if they have advertised an open position, right? But they're really looking for a physical chemist. They're really looking for a polymer chemist. Like you have absolutely no idea. Uh, and part of the reasons people have open searches is so that you, you know, if there's the greatest peak chemist they've ever seen, but they're not looking for that, they can still interview that person. Um, so don't take it personal when you don't get an interview at a place and also don't take it personal when you don't get a job at a place. You know, there's certain places you may have been like, oh, I felt like I was a really good fit, but they were looking for something else. You know, don't, it's, you know, they can't offer it to everyone and you have no idea why uh, they offer it to the candidate that they offer it to. Um, you hope it's you. Actually, some places I hoped it wasn't me. <laughs> um, but, you know, people talk about fit. Oh, do you fit in the department? And no one will ever tell you what that means, but you'll go and you'll interview a place and you'll say like, yeah, I could definitely work with these people or absolutely not. I just like my personality doesn't fit or my values don't fit or things like that. So, I mean, it's hard to hear. Don't take it personal. But, you know, I think that's something that I didn't know as a candidate. Uh, I, I would apply to places and I'd be like, that's weird. I never got an interview. And then afterwards you can look at their interview list and it was like, you know, six analytical chemists. You're like, okay, well, it wasn't me. <laughs> um, so I think that's really important. I also think it's really important to just put your best uh, self forward. And so, you know, I got the advice before I, I started applying, just, you know, there is no one right way. There's many ways to do this. And so you can kind of like listen to the noise and you can kind of like, you can look at who uh, is also being interviewed. Oftentimes the seminar schedules are public and you can see who else is you're up against and their pedigrees. And I just, I, my advice is just ignore that completely. Like it doesn't do you any good to know that the other person that interviewed right before you works for a Nobel prize winner. And the person that interviews right after, you know, is, uh, you know, has, you know, these Ivy League pedigrees that, you know, I don't have. And so I just kind of was like, you know what, I'm just put my best uh, self forward. And I am incredibly grateful that I did not like worry about who else was interviewing and, and on the job market at the time, I just put my best efforts forward. And I would encourage uh, everyone to do that. <laughs> because I know people that didn't do that. And it was a great deal of stress. So even thinking about Maybe this is a more general thing, but just in terms of what I feel like I've learned is about the academic job more generally. Um, and just that it is a very different experience uh, from being a grad student or a postdoc. Um, at some level, you become, in, you, you know, the discipline is very collaborative, you know a lot of people, but in many ways, because you're kind of carving out your own research program, um, you start to get a little bit scientifically isolated in some ways, right? So there's definitely, I felt like I had to make sure to keep putting in the energy to stay in contact with everyone around me, um, especially in my field, make sure I kept up with all the science. Um, so one of the things at POI is like, I'm one of two organic chemists, the only materials related chemist. And there's like one or two P chemists, one inorganic chemist. And so if I feel like at this job, no one ever told me this ahead of time, but there is some scientific kind of isolating effect that you really have to work to overcome. Um, if you're not active and reading the literature or going to conferences and meeting people, it's very easy to kind of get trapped into your little bubble of where you are and kind of lose touch of the community. Um, and I think the community is one of the best parts about chemistry, right? So um, definitely uh, that's what I would tell someone thinking about this type of job. And that's in contrast to an R1 where you know, the division has like five or ten organic chemists, let's say, right? And there's just a little bit more of an inherent institutional network that you have, whereas here I have to make sure I have that kind of outside the institution as well. Thinking seriously about the type of group you want to run, you know, what, what do you want your group to do? Do you want to have a group of 15 people? That means writing multiple, writing and winning multiple grants every year. Do you want to have a smaller group? You know, 
what what types of science do you want to do? What's it going to cost? And like think seriously about the kind of group you envision for yourself before you apply, because that sort of sets the scope of like what are what kinds of proposals do you want? What is your startup request? What schools should you apply for? You know things like that. And then talking to a lot of mentors about if the mentors think that's a good fit too, and um, you know if. The track record and and what they see in what you've been doing, um, if you know they think that this would be a good position too, and then I think apply like mad, <laughs> like don't don't talk yourself out of applying somewhere. And I think if it doesn't seem like the description is a perfect fit, I I would definitely suggest applying anyway. Um, the perfect fit places are obviously more likely in terms of getting an interview, but. Um, applying widely doesn't hurt and I think in the, there are a lot of cases where it sort of serendipitously works out so not talking yourself out of applying places is super important. It is unlike anything that you will have ever done and will ever do um, and it is an incredibly stressful process but uh, you know so make sure you have a, a good network of people that are supporting you um, but it's also a really fun process it, it, I can honestly say the time in my entire academic life it is like one of the most enjoyable because you get to do your ideas uh, you get to think about the science you're most interested in you're not tied to somebody else's grant you're not tied to a postdoc fellowship project that you wrote for like it's like an incredibly fun and exciting time so just it will be stressful you'll lose a lot of sleep but at the same time just like embrace like what the process is and how uh, fantastic it is that for you know maybe the first time in your life that you have the opportunity to really like share your passion and your creativity as a as a scientist and so it can be a really really fun process I mean, I felt like I didn't really know what I was doing either, and I think that's a common refrain. There's a few people who like really know what they want to do and they go do it, uh, but for most of us, there's just uh, even in undergrad and grad school, it's just a little bit of exploration. Um, so I definitely would encourage students to try to take on these opportunities. So like the teaching thing I did was really great for me. Um, I've heard of kind of more business-minded programs. So I know Northwestern at least had a kind of a business class for science graduate students uh, type of a program. Um, so yeah, the biggest thing I think is really just to explore the options. I think people have a sense that they might like certain things, right? And that um, if you kind of really sit down and think about what do you like about grad school, what don't you like about grad school, um, that's a good starting point to help you kind of fine tune where you might want to end up later. And then taking opportunities to test those out a little bit as much as you can. Um, are really useful. And I guess the last thing is really to talk to as many people as you can, right? Because um, there's all sorts of careers that people have gone into after a chemistry or a science PhD. Um, and a lot of people are very happy doing whatever they're doing. Right? So it's good to kind of learn about all the options.